Hey guys, I'm Redeemed Zoomer, and today I'm joined by David Yancey, who is the president of a new organization called Presbyterians for the Kingdom. It's a nonprofit that we started together, made up of PC USA Presbyterians who are trying to restore our liberal denomination to its biblical and confessional roots. And we have a big announcement today. So, David, what would you like to announce to everyone? Well, first, thanks for having me, Richard. And I would like to announce that we have crafted a statement of faith uh, that we hope to have added to the Book of Confessions in the PCUSA with the help of pastors and laity alike. Right. So we made a statement of faith with the help of conservative pastors in the PCUSA. So the statement of faith was a collaboration, and like you said, between laity and clergy, between laymen like us, because this is a lay-led organization, but we have oversight from biblically-based pastors in our denomination, as well as guidance from pastors and other conservative Presbyterian denominations like the PCA. We'd also like to announce we've been working with pastors and seminary professors to give you guys a free online course in Reformed Theology, so anyone who watches these 10 short videos can quickly become an expert in Reformed Theology. They're going to be accessible in my YouTube channel and on the Presbyterians for the Kingdom website, and the goal is basically just to spread good Reformed Theology in the PC USA. We're going to go over our statement of faith in a second, but first, why is it necessary? What is the big problem that we need to fix in our denomination? Yeah, I think that it can boil down to two words, and that is theological liberalism. Uh, you've seen just a general decline in the faithfulness of the church and the adherence to the Holy Scriptures. And I just think that, you know, from our peak in 1965 at 4.25 million, uh, we're down to 1.1 million. I didn't which... know that much. I didn't know yeah. it, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised in which witches actually outnumber Presbyterians in the United States. And theological liberalism doesn't just mean Christians who are politically liberal. Theological liberalism means you don't really believe the faiths of, you don't really believe the Christian faith anymore. And I'm gonna share my screen right here. There's some very striking examples of theological liberalism in our denomination. Um, which I'll, just, I'll, share, I'll show you. Uh, so yeah, you can, can you see this? Uh, this is an example of something that's pretty regular in our denomination. There are churches where you don't even really need to believe in God. Now, this is, of course, the very extreme end of our denomination. Most of our denomination is not this theologically liberal, but it's very common for churches in our denomination to be a lot more about politics than about the gospel. It's very common for our churches to be progressive on social issues like abortion, gay marriage, and we're trying to change that. And we wrote a statement of faith that addresses many of the problems in our denomination and also says positively what we do believe. It's not just complaining about what we don't like in our denomination. And what we're doing, we're not just here to try to change our denomination with our statement of faith, but we're here to actually provide theological content. We are making a theology course, a reformed theology course. Um, it's going to be posted on my YouTube channel. It's going to be a series of 10 short videos. And the goal is that by the end of watching it, um, you will, you can be a mat, you can be an expert in reformed theology, just watching the reformed theology videos that we're going to put out. So there are starving souls. So to basically feed the sheep in our denomination, uh, we're going to provide theological content. So people in our denomination can be equipped with the resources to help guide and, and correct our denomination. So I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, and then we can go over our statement of faith. Now the statement of faith was written by several people. Um, so this is our website. This is our new website. You can find a link in the description. Uh, there is a place to donate. If you click this button, you can donate. Uh, and we would very much appreciate your donations. I mean, we don't need that much, but it costs some to keep this website running and stuff. And we might need to fund some trips to the PCUSA's General Assembly so we can try and make change at the denominational level. Uh, so our statement of faith is called the kingdom statement of faith and our hope is that eventually this might become an actual confession in the presbyterian church usa that's a bit of a stretch but yeah do you want to go over the different sections of it yeah that'd be great um so 
Yeah, we're not under the impression, as uh, Richard said, that this is just going to pass at this general assembly. Uh, however, you've got the liberals in the denomination who now run the show, uh, who garnered, you know, 20 percent of the vote on stuff like this, uh, you know, just 20 years ago. And right. so we want to let um, the establishment know that that Bible-believing folks still exist uh, and uh, that the pastor-to-pew gap is is just so large uh, currently. Right. So this is our, this is the prelude uh, to our statement of faith, basically saying why it's necessary. Um, you guys know the deal with the PCUSA. I don't need to beat this dead horse. Um, we know that the PCUSA, while it confesses the Christian faith on paper, it does not enforce it in practice. And that's why there's so many pastors and synods and even the General Assembly itself who will say things directly contrary to the Christian faith, which you know very well about. So we have this prelude. Uh, if there's anything more you want to say about that, you can say it. If not, we'll move on to the actual sections. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just an explanation of, of why we're doing this. Um, and mm -hmm. I think... I think the last uh, paragraph uh, in the prelude, it says, in a spirit of loving correction and rooted in a genuine commitment to the principles that shape our identity, may the following statement of faith be presented. That's, that's the reason we're doing this. Yes. So we start, this is structured very similar to the Scots Confession, which, as you all know, is my personal favorite Presbyterian confession. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith is the most famous of the Presbyterian confessions, but the PCUSA actually uses many more confessions than that, including the Scots Confession, which is earlier. The Scots Confession was written by John Knox himself. And the Scots Confession just has brief paragraphs on all the major issues, and the Scots Confession, in very true Reformed fashion, starts with God. Our doctrine of God matters more than everything else, and basically all the problems in the PCUSA uh, stem from a flawed a doctrine of God of people not taking God seriously anymore because really theological liberalism is nothing but basically implicit atheism and not believing in God. That's what all of theological liberalism basically stems from. So we don't have to read all of this. Our website is linked in the description. You can read it for yourself. We confess basic Trinitarian orthodoxy here. Um, yes, filioque, but unless you're Eastern Orthodox, you can agree with all this paragraph. If you are Eastern Orthodox, you can agree with everything except these three words. Um, but yeah, this is where all doctrine needs to start. So, so then after that, um, we move on to the doctrine of scripture, because I would say the first um, step in theological liberalism is not having a good doctrine of God. The next step is probably not having a good doctrine of scripture, because almost all errors are due to not believing the Bible is the infallible word of God. So that's why we say the Bible is the uniquely inspired and infallible word of God. Um, now, the PCUSA officially says uh, the Bible is the uniquely in, uh, the uniquely authoritative witness to Christ, which is true, but they often don't go far enough. So we're saying it's the infallible word of God. Anything to say about that? Yeah, I, I, do, I think that you have seen... Uh over the past number of decades, just a disregard for scripture. Uh, a, and I think that basically all, all sin stems from, you know, Satan really asking in the garden, did God really say? Yeah. Uh, and, and we are here to say that, yes, God really said. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, also that, uh, another form of sin, right, is, is adding on to what God has said. Uh, it, it's yeah. why Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. Uh, their, their oral tradition was just so out of step with uh, the actual scriptures. Um, and so we were here to affirm uh, the infallibility and the uh, basically just the lamp uh, unto our feet and a light unto our path aspect of scripture. I'm like, this, this is, uh, as John Wesley 
coined and Thomas Aquinas sort of made famous, we want to be a man of one book. Uh, yes. So. Uh, yeah. Um, this David wrote most of this. Um, I wrote some of it. Pastors oversaw and edited every almost every part of this. So we have one section on creation here. Pretty straightforward. And then we talk about sin. I think most of the times in almost every liberal church, they have a weak doctrine of sin. They trivialize sin. They say something like sin is just forgetting how loved we are or something like that. And we say that the guilt of Adam and Eve's sin was imputed to all offspring. So we affirm original sin. And we say that because of original sin, we all deserve to go to hell. That is basic Calvinist doctrine. Really, I think it's basic Christian doctrine, at least Western Christian doctrine. Um, I'm sure you've also seen a very weak doctrine of sin in some parts of our denomination, particularly the more liberal parts, right? Certainly, yeah. Um, I, I think there's there's pastors in the presbytery that uh, that I'm in that would have say that there's no sin, uh, that sin yeah. doesn't exist. Um, yeah, my and, presbytery is pretty liberal too. Yeah, so Extremely. yeah, I, I think that. Uh, this is not the greatest, like the greatest issue in our denomination. Uh, but I will say that I think all of the issues sort of stem from the sin, right? The sin of, of not, you know, having the right doctrine of God, not worshiping the same God as, as the, uh, as Christians do yeah. creating a God in your own head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so sin is a neglected topic in our denomination. Sin and salvation, really, uh, because there's a lot of liberation theology in our denomination. Liberal Liberation theology is not simply the fact that the church should help liberate the oppressed. Of course, we believe that. Liberation theology specifically redefines salvation as liberation from earthly circumstances instead of spiritual salvation. So we say that salvation is by Christ, not by social justice. Again, Christ inspires us to do justice in the world. It's not the same as liberation theology. Of course, we confess that the virgin birth, we confess that Mary is the Theotokos, the mother of God. We're not Nestorians. Um, and we do say in the passage about salvation, Jesus did give good news to the poor, freedom for prisoners, sight for the blind, liberation for the oppressed. I think one of the good things about our mainline denomination that a lot of evangelicals forget is you know, just because this, the core of the gospel isn't social justice, it, that doesn't mean that the gospel does not call us to do social justice. I know some people don't like the term social justice, but it absolutely does. The gospel is about the transformation of this world, which includes liberation from earthly oppression. That's not the core of the, it's not the core of the gospel, but it is a fruit of the gospel. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that another distinctly Calvinist section in this uh, is that he willingly went to the cross to take our rightful place and atone our sin, an atonement sufficient for the whole world, but efficient only for those whom God has called to himself. Yes. And that uh, when, Christ, when God the Father looks on us, he does not look at what works we've done. He looks at the perfect life and perfect death uh, of Christ. Uh, and that is our only hope, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so. For sure. So yeah, we don't need to go through all this. This is basic Protestant orthodoxy. I don't want to take up too much of people's time. So for predestination in the PCUSA, uh, the conservative faction of the PCUSA is a bit split between a more Westminsterian, Westminster view of predestination and more of a Bardian view. And we try to make room for both of those views, both David and I and basically everyone in our organization are five point Calvinist double predestinarians. I know I am, uh, but we understand that for the time being, we need to make alliances with those who are not. So this chapter on predestination affirms monergistic predestination, not based on free will. But I think this does make room for a Bardian view. And I think the Bardian view of election is correct in saying that Christ is really the elect one and we're elect by being united to Christ. However, unlike Bart, I would not necessarily deny individual election. Um, 
So just like all circumstances, we need to, uh, we, we do need to take into account the, the way that our denomination is. Um, and, you know, providence, the idea of God controlling everything, we absolutely believe that. Covenant theology, we believe that. Um, okay. Now, in the sacraments, we try to have a very high sacramentology. Uh, we try to have a sacramentology that's as high as the Scots Confession. Uh, yeah, I, I just think that uh, we want to adhere to the traditional Reformed understanding of sacramentology, uh, and we don't necessarily exclude people who uh, might have just you know, don't agree with every word of, of that sacramentology that we outline, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but we do want to be distinctly Presbyterian and, and not pseudo, uh, you know, Baptist or, or pseudo Roman Catholic. We want to be yeah. distinctly reformed. Right. So now marriage and sexuality, obviously a big portion of the PCUSA is LGBTQ affirming, disregarding the biblical teaching on that issue. So um, God instituted marriage as a covenant between one man and one woman. Um, you all know the story. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So any sexual relationship outside the bounds of this matrimony is disordered, not good for the flourishing of men and women collectively and as individuals. Yeah, we, uh, I think that once the church, you know, sort of caved on this, uh, you saw, you know, as I mentioned at one point, you know, 1965, we had 4.25 million members. Uh, yes. And I, I'm, you know, our membership has been cut in half in the past, you know, decade or so uh, over this very issue. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily that that this sin is somehow dirtier than the rest uh it's, it's just that we've never come out and explicitly endorsed a sin uh, or right. said that that this sin is okay and that our ministers can be in these relationships or that uh they can bless them and 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 as if they're a matrimony uh, which of course they're not no matter the blessing uh, of a minister Right. So we, um, our statement is against homosexual marriage. We also address transgenderism in a section on man and woman. So the distinction between male and female is built into the world. The so-called gender binary is actually good. Distinctions are good in the Bible. Um, so some people say gender is a social construct today. That's relativism and relativism is implicit atheism. We do not believe a man can be a woman. A woman can't be a man. And you can't be in between either. Um, so we take a firm stand on that uh, because that's also, a, 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 I'd say, an equally big issue in our denomination uh, these days. Right. And then the PCUSA has, has been ordaining uh, people who deny that God created them male and female. People, the PCUSA is ordaining people who deny God, period. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised. Um, and, of course, human life is very important because abortion i'd say abortion and uh, same-sex marriage are the two sins that the denomination actually gets away with promoting the only thing is the, the difference is that protestant denominations have had a problem with supporting abortion for like the past hundred years like the southern baptist convention in the 1970s uh helped roe v wade become a thing so the same-sex marriage debate's more of a new thing by by new i mean new in the relative to the past century, whereas Protestants have been bad about abortion for a long time. Generally, it used to be that Protestants were pro-choice and Catholics were pro-life. Luckily, evangelical Protestants have realized abortion is murder, um, hoping the mainline Protestants will come around to that as well. And you might think this is, we're getting too political. We say that uh, we don't really take a stand on politics because uh, there's uh, two kingdoms. We're not, you know, radical two kingdoms, but there are two kingdoms and we can agree to disagree on political issues. We don't think abortion and homosexuality are political issues. They're made political, but really they're moral issues. And we certainly don't think that the church should be putting out political statements uh, about every 
every political issue, um, mm-hmm. they've been taking sides. Uh, you know, and there's obviously some clear sides to be taken, but they've been taking sides uh, in wars that there's obviously a clear side to be taken and they take the opposite side um, or they take the side of a secular political organization uh, when really it's not the church's job to, to really dive into politics in that manner. Uh, so that, yeah. that's a big, that's a big section of our confession. Uh, and, and we, we don't want to see politics uh, being preached from the pulpit. Uh, it, we're there, we're here to hear the gospel uh, and, and not, uh, you know, what you believe politically. Uh, and, and we affirm that you can uh, be and in the USA, for instance, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, Independent, non-voter, uh, and still be a beloved child of God. Right. And we need to recognize the dignity of every human being and realize that they're made in God's image. So now we have quick affirmations and rejections. Um, so we affirm the sovereignty of God and uh, all, all these things we've sort of already said in other places. Uh, important thing is we affirm science and faith both lead us to the truth. And we do not believe there's a contradiction between faith and science. Um, everyone knows I myself am an evolutionist. Now, not everyone in Presbyterians for the Kingdom is an evolutionist. You don't have to be an evolutionist to support Presbyterians for the Kingdom. Our point is that what we do say is there is no conf- there's no conflict between faith and science. So some people reject evolution because they don't think there's scientific evidence for it. Um, that's fine. What we do reject is both the idea that science, modern science, disproves traditional faith, because there are some liberals who think that, and we reject the idea that we should distrust science because it challenges our faith. Uh, We believe that we should affirm both faith and science. Right. Yeah. And and so I I think that this confession is uh, broad in the sense that it includes uh, basically all levels of reformed orthodoxy and Mm -hmm. all viewpoints. uh, And we uh, want to pass this in a few presbyteries and uh, get it to GA, uh, General Assembly. Sorry, that's just nerdy Presbyterian talk, but GA. Um, and so, you know, we we need help in the sense that we could use you sharing this with your pastor, you sharing this with your elders, um, you just talking about it with your friends. Uh, we could use donations. Uh, We're going to be traveling a lot. We're going to be going to talk with people at presbyteries. Uh, We're going to be going to uh, General Assembly. We're going to be going to uh, national gatherings of other conservative Presbyterian uh, nonprofits. And uh, we just need your support. Uh, But I think the most important thing you can do for us is pray. Uh, we, We need uh, we believe that the prayer uh, does in, induce change and it and induces um, whatever God has willed. And, and we, we want that God, or we want uh, the blessing of, of God going forward. And, and we believe that we have it and we want to be uh, blessed through your prayers and through your support. And uh, I think that uh, with that, we, we have our website here and we would love for you to follow us um, on the website. We've got our classroom section here in the uh, Learning yes. Reform Theology. Uh, Richard, yeah. if you want to speak to, uh, about that. Yeah, briefly. So like I said, we are going to make a Reformed Theology course available to the public. It's going to be a series of 10 Reformed theology videos, probably about 10 minutes each. Um, And the intention is that after watching all those videos, you can be an expert on Reformed theology. I'm going to try and uh, distill as much of the content as possible. Um, We are not thinking of this by ourselves. 
there are pastors and seminary professors, especially those at Theology Matters, who's going to be linked in the description. There are pastors and seminary professors who are supporting us, but they don't have accessible resources. They're the ones with the res with, they're the ones with the um, you know, not theological knowledge. I'm the one with the YouTube channel where I can make that more accessible. So I'm basically gonna, gonna distill what they say into 10 short videos. Um, so there these 10 chapters, of course, the videos don't exist yet, so nothing's gonna happen if you click watch video. They're gonna come out over the course of the next few months. But it's just gonna it's a walkthrough of all of church history from a reformed perspective. So first you start with the Christian essentials, like just Nicene Creed basically. Then you get to some more advanced Christology. We're thinking, uh, talking about Nestorianism and Chalcedon, maybe even Dioenergism or Diathelitism, uh, the more late antiquity stuff. Then we're going to talk about, uh, before we talk about the Protestant Reformation, we're going to talk about the Great Schism and how Western theology, Catholic and Protestant, is different in many ways from Eastern theology. And we're going to talk about medieval medieval theology like St. Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus and especially St. Anselm, why the Filioque matters, why we are Western and not Eastern Christians. Um, then we're going to talk about the Protestant Reformation and like, you know, uh, what does it mean that we are Protestant? Does that mean this is a new church? The answer is no. We are the Catholic Church reformed by the Bible. Then we're going to talk about the Reformed view of the sacraments, and for that we're drawing a lot on the Scots Confession, especially the Scots Confession. Then we get into predestination. If you want to learn about predestination, you read the Canons of Dort. Uh, then we talk about specifically the Presbyterian government, because uh, the name Presbyterian comes from our form of government. Then we're going to talk about covenant theology, another big aspect of Reformed theology. It's how Reformed people read the Bible. And then we're going to talk about stuff that you probably won't hear about in a PCA church or an OPC church. We're going to talk about neo-orthodoxy because neo-orthodoxy um, is basically sort of a middle road between liberalism and fundamentalism. And I think neo-orthodoxy was fundamentally good for the mainline church because it made it possible to be orthodox while still being in the mainline institutions. And then we're going to talk about kingdom theology, like N.T. Wright and that kind of stuff. And our own movement is very inspired by kingdom theology. So that's about it for right now. Anything you'd like to add before we call it a day? Uh, yeah. So just in the, as you said earlier, in the description is going to be the link to uh, our donor box. And we're also going to put our website in the description. We'd appreciate you following on all socials, uh, on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and uh, please join uh, the Discord, uh, the Rikisa Discord, uh, if you are in the Presbyterian Church USA, because we'd love to uh, chat with you. And if you need to reach out to us, we have our contact info also on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and other than that, just we want everyone to be blessed and uh, abide in God and uh, trust that God is abiding in us. All right. So, yeah, thanks all for watching. Uh, we're going to leave a map of, you know, moderate to conservative PC USA churches in the description. If you want to join the movement, you can help revive and support those churches because they do exist. And yeah, please keep us in your prayers. Uh, donate if you're able. Any amount helps, even if it's just like $1 or something. Uh, and yeah, I'm very excited to see what's going to happen next. God bless.